in the live stream, you can see me. Yeah, and of course, people are in the room. Yeah, so today I will be today I will this is Python track, and yeah, I hope everyone has a breakfast. So I will be speaking on like how this to like speed up your data processing using parallel and asynchronous process programming in Python. Yeah, so yeah, my name is Chin Hui, and I am a data engineer at ST Engineering. So my back, so I come from a background in aerospace engineering as well as computational modeling, and then I, I stumbled myself into the world of data analytics. Uh, and yeah, so far I've contributed to Pandas one release as well as like, in the documentation, and I also volunteered my time as a man, as a mentor at Big Data X, which is one of the one of the data communities we hold workshops for data engineering. Okay, so. Yeah, so a typical workflow for my job, right? So this is a typical data science workflow. So first we extract the raw data, and then we process the data. After which we go and train the model, fine tune the model, and then we, and then when everything is fine, we deploy the model. Yeah, so seems to be quite straightforward, right? But unfortunately, usually there will be some bottlenecks in the project. Usually, so it could be a lack of data or the data could be of poor quality. But usually, like most of the time, the, bottom, the main bottleneck for any data science project is data processing. So, like those people, laymen, like to say that, oh, it's 80% 80 to 20, so it's oh. fine. But in actual fact, it's actually closer to 90 10 than 80 20. Yeah, so that's why I have a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in fact, so in data science, we we our core language is Python, so we use a lot of Python. And then usually when we start Python, we start with for loops. Right. So yeah, the, but then the problem is that your for loops run on the interpreter. It's not compiled code, and. Yeah, although Python is actually built on top of C, but then like the difference is that C is actually running on the compiler, compile compile code, but for Python it's like interpreting the variables and stuff, and then you have the overhead there. So it's much slower compared to C. So it looks so simple, it looks so neat, but I'm, uh, it's infamously slow. So what to do? So that's where Python introduced the concept of list comprehensions. So list comprehension is slightly faster than for loops because you do not need to keep appending your function keep, keep the, or like add your variable to your list at every iteration. And plus it looks neater, right? Oh, it's one line. Right? Yeah, it's one line, it looks neater, it looks cleaner, and you don't need to keep saying calling a pair function. But well, it's not quite that fast, you know. So that's why like you have the guys from Pandas who who try to optimize the code such that they are using a bit of the good setup about C and the good stuff about Pandas and they and they optimize it for in-memory analytics using the using data frames. So data frames actually come from R, but they are sort of trying to adapt the concept to Python. So well, Pandas is good uh, for your data analytics. In fact, like it's our favorite library. But then when it comes to those slightly bigger data, we face an issue. So just last week, my, uh, my data scientist asked me like, about loading the data. And he complained that when he loads the data, he runs out of memory. And then he said, how am I going to read the data? And that's, another, that's just one complaint. Another data scientist said that, oh, why is my code so slow? Is there a way for me to speed up? by Pandas operations. So when you are dealing with like larger data sets that are more than one gigabyte, you tend to run out of you tend to run into performance and out of memory issues, which Pandas is like you know, Pandas would not be sufficient for you to solve your data processing issues. So okay now, so if I run my if I run into problems using Pandas, then the boss will just say, why not just use the Spark cluster? Just Spark the wonderful thing, like it's just 
showing your it's like that big data, right? Big data. But it's not so hype. So it doesn't mean that like just because you have big data, you will just you need to use the spark faster. Because because okay, anyone knows what spark is? Okay. So the concept of spark is that I have I have I so I, right now I have one computer and I'm running my code. But the concept of Spark is that I have multiple computers running the code at the same time. But then to be able to run the code at the same time, they also need to communicate with each other. And then when you know that I try to communicate with from my phone, right? Because my phone is like a computer. I try to com I try, let's say I try to send a WhatsApp message, message to your phone. And then you will have a delay. So there's this communication overhead over there. Then it's the same thing for like a spark cluster. Your computers need to communicate across each other, across the network. And that is not then that is usually a, a major overhead. So that's one thing. And another good thing, and another, another point to note is that your data will be big, but it may not be big enough to justify using a spark cluster. So just be, so okay so so for that I will refer to a talk by but a talk at a Pi Data by Timothy Choring. So he brought the concept of small big data, whereby your data is too big to fit in memory, but it's too small to justify a spark cluster because you have to set up a spark cluster, you have to you have to manage the overheads. And then at the end of the day, you realize that it's not worth it. It's simply not worth it. So, what would be the intermediate solution? So, I don't want to have like multiple computers, right? But I sort of want to have multiple computers running my code. So, that comes to the question of like, what is parallel processing? What exactly is parallel processing? So, yeah, people like so. I shall not bore you with the definitions because it's so early in the morning. But let's imagine that I work in Yakun. Uh, maybe the up, the more upmarket version of Yakun. So my toast, right, is made to order. It's like I'm trying to make it like gourmet, make to order one toaster per slice, you know, like the type of very pampered bread. And then each slice of toast, right, I go and control it nicely until it's two minutes. It's nicely charred and brown, kind of crispy. And I assume that there's no overhead time. Yes. Sorry, sorry. And then like <laughs> so the, the way that we usually do things is that okay, I do sequential processing, right? So imagine I have hundred slices of bread because my 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 toast I put very popular, right? A lot of people want to eat bread. And I have hundred of them. And then I go through the oven. So the in this case, right, your, your toaster, your oven, right, is like your processor and your worker. And then and then after you go through the worker, right, the, to the toaster, you get hundred slices of toast. But then if I go and take the bread, I go and put it nicely in the toaster and then take it out and then put it aside and then do it 100 times. This is how much time it takes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, I think your customers will run away already. Don't, don't stop. But then if I do parallel processing, same thing, I have 100 slices of bread. And right now, right, I go and split into four batches. Uh. One batch, two batch, three batch, one batch. Each batch, 25 toast. I go and buy four toasters. And then every time I go and put all, I go and put the bread right, into your four toasters. And then, so let's say like, okay, we need two minutes. Instead of just one toast, right? Now I have four toasts. And consider that they are actually like running in parallel and they are independent of each other. So which means that, okay, if one toast is a bit overheating, it doesn't really affect the other toasters. And then finally, the output of your toasting process is consolidated and then written as like an overall output. So yeah, you get your job done. Huh? And, and, the, and, the, and you don't label your toast, huh? so you don't really care whether it's ordered or not. 
So in terms of the execution time, right, you see 100 toes, 2 minutes, right, for the toes. But then now I divide across 4 toasters. So instead of like, taking very, very long, right, now I process like what? 50 minutes only, you know? 100 toes. So it's quite quick. So it's relatively more efficient. So now I talk about like, parallel processing, right? Now I'm talking about synchronous versus asynchronous. So what do you, I mean by asynchronous? We have to talk about synchronous first, right? So Yakun don't only serve toast. They also serve coffee. But then well, because I want to work in a more because I my cafe is more atas than Yakun. So I will go make coffee. But the assumption is that or I move my coffee, right? I can do other stuff like check my phone, uh, crack some eggs, uh, make some toast, and brew a cup of coffee at the coffee machine. So I just stand there and wait for the coffee to be done. Five minutes. And then after the coffee is done, then I go and make my toast. So five minutes for coffee, two minutes for toast. Then just to make a cup of coffee and toast set, right? I take seven minutes. I don't wait so long at Yakun. But then if I do the asynchronous way, right? It means well I brew my coffee, which actually takes longer than making a toast. Right? I go and make some toast. Then while well, coffee is still running, like taking five minutes, and then my toast takes two minutes. I can I can make my toast twice. You know? So after five minutes, I have two toast and a coffee. Yeah, and better than uh, better than I wait and wait and wait and wait and I I get I, I spend seven minutes just waiting. Yeah. So that's the concept of asynchronous. Hey, hey, like wow, there's a lot of like save like I save a lot of time, but you no. Know, hey, maybe I buy two hundred and fifty six core, then I speed up everything. But is that really the case? But because we are in the real world, there are some practical considerations we have to consider. Number one, is your code already optimized? Sometimes, right? If you are still using your forms that complain you that your code is slow or like and something, you might need to rethink your approach in how you write your code. So let's say, yeah, use your list combinations, lah. Don't use for loop. Secondly, it could be your problem architecture. Right? I mean. If I have like, if I'm just doing a like about I'm just having a function right such as I throw one thousand things in I just do the same thing then I get one thousand things out then and then they don't relate with each other okay we can do the parallelizing like that but then if your if but then if what you're thinking of is that all those output right they will all those processes right they will depend on each other. Then you have to consider how to structure your code such that you can actually do a par paralyzing. And usually it's not a very good idea. Because it's not just about like it's not just about I want to chuck everything in into 256 core. You need to consider like whether the tasks are independent from each other and whether the data is independent from each other. And on top of the raw architecture, you also need to think about the overheads in the in, term, in parallelism. Because the rule of parallelism is number one rule of parallelism is that there will always be parts of the work that cannot be parallelized. So this this is known as Amnon's law. Yeah, so I have to emphasize this. There will always be parts of your code that cannot be parallelized. So even if you have 256 cores, it's not going to solve your problem. And on top of that, you also need extra time for coding and debugging your code such that you can move from sequential to parallel. So that will add an increased complexity to your workflow. And even after you optimize it, there will still be system overhead, including communication overhead. So remember when I talk about a Spark cluster, but you have to communicate across your computes. In this case, right? Yes, it's not so bad because you're communicating within your compute, but still you have call, your communic your communication between your calls is still going to add up to the overhead. 
And yeah, for completeness, Amdahl's law will state that the, this the theoretical speed up is defined by this function. Yeah, so I'm just talking about theoretical, it's not even about the practical speed up yet. And theoretically, if there are no parallel parts at all, your speed up is zero, absolute zero. If all parts are parallel, yeah, granted, yeah, it will be infinity, but is that but we don't have that. So usually our speed up will be limited by the fraction of the work that can parallelize. So if you even if you buy the most expensive 256 column machine, you're not going to get a like linear improvement in even with like 256, 512. So you can look at the chart itself, like you can see that that is like a flattening in terms of how much you can speed up. Yeah. And then there's there's also two types. So there's two types of parallelism that we can actually use. One is multi-processing and one is multi-threading. So multi-processing is like you are you are doing parallelism across multiple processors using multiple processors. So it's sort of I'm running I'm running my processors using multiple multiple toasters in my cafe. For multi-threading, right? It's so it's executing multiple threads of sub-processors at the same time within a single processor. So as a, so example would be, I like let's say I have a single processor which usually has two threads uh, in a in a in a call, and then one thread does something, and then another thread will have to do will do something else. Yeah. So because of the nature of how like. Multi-processing, multi-trading is multi-trading is best suited for I/O or blocking operation. While you mod, while if you're trying to process large like volumes of data or like computational heavy stuff, it was a better idea to use multiple processors rather than multiple threads. Because why why is it the case? Because number one, data processing tends to be more compute intensive. So if usually I will be doing like doing something with data, like doing a map function or trying to calculate something. So those are compute intensive. And then if I go to keep switching between the threads, right, just to perform my operation, it will become increasingly inefficient. And to add on to your problems, Python has a GIL. Yeah, the GIL I know that it's something that can that can piss people off in a way, because it doesn't allow you to do pure multi-threading. Yeah, because GIL, right, you have a lock on your thread. So it does not allow parallel thread execution. So, how oh, it's okay. So, I can't do parallel thread execution. So, how do I do parallel, par parallel programming in Python? Right? And plus, I want to do it asynchronously. Eh? I don't want to wait for something and then before I can do the next task. So, so well, we do have, so Python is actually quite okay in it. They do have a concurrent.futures module within their, within Python itself, which is a high level API for launching asynchronous parallel tasks. So, it's so this is actually introduced in Python 3.2. Uh, note that we are at Python three point eight already, so this module is already like a couple of years old. So there's so it's an expression area over your multi processing. So there are two modes of execution: it's the process pool and the thread pool executor. And then if we look at the Python standard library, right, it does state like what's the difference between process pool and thread pool. So for process pool, you have the option to chop your intervals into a number of chunks. And then separate them the tasks, and then it will actually improve your performance. But for multi-threading, it doesn't really, it doesn't really give you the improvements in terms of checking out the chunks. And then remember that we talked about multi-threading and multi-processing. So the so about process pool executor is your multi-processing. Thread pool executor is your multi-threading. So because process pool executor uses multi-processing it will start step the GIL, which means that you don't need to worry about your threading issues. But for thread pool executor, you still need to worry about the GIL. Because you need to be concerned about locking. So that is the difference between 
the two executors. And in, in this module, we have in this particular Python module, we have an executor.submit, which will take as input a function as well as its input argument. And then it returns a futures object that will represent the execution of the function. So it's not exactly your output, it's basically a representation of your function or your function executing each of each of them. As for map, right, in executor, it is similar to the map function in Python. So it takes as input your color, your function that you want to run, and then as well as a list where each element in the list will be the input to your function. And then what it returns is, is an iterator that will yield the results of the functions being applied to every element of the list. So that means that when I run my executor.map, right, I don't get the result immediately. I will have to extract the results from the executor to store it somewhere. Okay, so okay, so one, one of the cases that I would like to illustrate would be like a net for a network IO operation. So in this case, I would like to extract some data from the data.graph real time weather readings. So I have some so the response would be the JSON JSON format. So it's like calling the API trying to pull the response, pull the data from the API. So first I initialize my module. Okay, for trading, right? So I so you realize I have trading. Why do I need the trading? Because I will need to monitor my API request. Like which thread is the API request running on? And then I initialize my submission. Like it's like my dose, like, like it's like my bread. Uh. And then okay, I try list compression because list compression is the better is a good way in Python. Right? Then if I use these comprehensions, it takes almost 17 minutes to pull, like to make 100 API requests. I think I can eat a meal during that time. But then if I use thread pull executor to execute the API request, I, I actually get a speed up of about 20, 21 times. So, I, so it's actually completed in less than a minute. Yeah, it's actually less than a minute. And then now another case would be for image processing. So typically for image processing, like, our images will be quite big. And we try to we will try to size it up to a, to a unified dimension so that we can actually train our model. So in this case, right, our data set contains like images of different dimensions. Some can be like, the really long one, some can be really small, but we need to uni we need to standardize them. So same thing, I initialize my modules. I init I go and define the process that I want to run on all the images. So in this case, I use on.getPID to monitor the process execution. Because I'm trying to monitor the processor. So it's different from when the from the previous case where I am actually trying to monitor the thread execution. So as usual, I initialize like what I, I initialize what I want to process. So in this case, I have about 1,431 images to process. So if I use, in this case, right, it's, right, it's, it's fairly straightforward for us to use map. Because it's sort of, I put a toast, I put bread, I, and then I throw, I throw in toaster, and then I get the toast. So my in, so in this case, is I get image, I try to resize it, I take it out. So map should work quite, map should be quite intuitive, right? But guess what? Thousand plus, thousand plus images, it takes 29.48 seconds. Uh, imagine that your data set has like a lot more images, like a hundred times of that. So let's try this compression because it's the optimized way to do so in Python. It, it's not much better. It's also around the same time. Also. But if I use process pool executor, right, and the, and, and the map function, and 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 I'm using an eight core machine. I can actually process like more than thousand images in just less than seven seconds. That is effectively a four point three times speed up. So 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 now you can see how concurrent features actually can speed up your data processing. So some key takeaways 
that we are that not all processors should be parallelized. It comes with overheads. Always remember MDAS law. On top of that, there are still system overheads such as the communication overhead. It's, yeah. And most importantly, if the cost of rewriting your code for parallelization right, actually outweighs the time savings that you can get, maybe your data is very small. Then maybe just think of other ways to parallelize your code. Lah. Like think of other ways to optimize your code, lah. like list comprehensions. And yeah, on top of that, stop using for loops. Use other ways to optimize your code to speed up your data processing. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so here's how you can reach out to me, and you can find my slides on GitHub. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shi. Does anyone have any questions? So, if you had a problem uh, with 30 minutes to pull the data from GitHub. Uh, yes, uh, trying to. Trying is it to because, I mean, I'm, I'm proposing it as a reason for that? Is it because they are paid to recovery in the end? Possible. It might be possible that they are really, they are really in this place. That prevents you from making like so many requests within a within like a call or like a chat. Okay, so how many how many data points you require? Yes. Okay. Because actually, right, this goes back. This this is related to one of my other projects. Right, I'm trying to pull about three years worth of data. So imagine that that's about thousand plus eight thousand plus. So the, the API the, the API is actually designed more for like the mobile applications or your web applications whereby you pull the data and you display it. So for that the data got graph API works fine. But then if I am That's what short yeah. chunks of data. Yes. Yeah. yeah but then if I'm the type to because well, I'm a data person now. So I want to be able to like get into the raw data and try and analyze it for myself. I don't I yeah there are like aggregated data that, that are on the CSV and stuff but I would prefer to work on the raw data and find it out for myself instead of reliably relying on data that has already been processed for, my, for me. Do they have I'm just curious, do they have a way for you to download the bulk of raw data? In this case for, for that? No, you have to use the API. API. Correct. It's purely API. So my subscription is probably very limited. Yeah, so uh, probably using the CAT tool would be a way to try to overcome that. But there will still be rate limiting, but at least you will have multiple threads to make the request. Yeah. Any other questions? Next talk is talking uh, Are there any other questions for Jiri? Oh, all right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi.